And yet we made an eight hour series by focusing on what very few other films have ever been able to see, which is what happens in the black box of the prosecutor's office. And I think if you want to try to understand how the United States became the most incarcerated country in the world, you have to look at the decisions that happen in a prosecutor's office. And that's what we were able to do in our series. Hi, I'm Julia Fidel. I'm the head of Berlinale series, and I am very pleased to now speak to the three creators of Philly DA, Ted Brook, Yoni Passan, and Nicole Salazar. Hello, Ted, Yoni, and Nicole. Maybe you want to give us, you know, a short summary what Philly DA is about. Sure. Uh, Philly DA essentially follows the um, election and first term of uh, probably the most controversial district attorney in uh, the United States, Larry Krasner, who was the district attorney of Philadelphia. And uh, he was a civil rights attorney who spent 30 years representing groups like Black Lives Matter, ACT UP, Occupy, and spent his whole career fighting the district attorney's office. And then kind of shocked everybody by throwing his hat in the ring to run to be the district attorney. And he ran on a platform of trying to use the office to end mass incarceration and shocks people even more when he actually won. And uh, so the series picks up with him during the election and essentially embeds in his office for his first term while at the same time kind of widening out and uh, becoming a 360 degree portrait of a city in the midst of a historic change. Um, and so uh, in addition to being in his office, we're also filming with police officers, with people who are incarcerated, with people who are on probation, with um, uh, city council people, people in government, defense attorneys, and just getting a wide scope of what it actually means to try to make change from inside the system. They didn't do a damn thing in this office in terms of changing these policies for 30 effing years. We were gonna do a phased rollout of improvement of bail practices for right now, phase one. Let's see what we can do around Sam. Small amounts of marijuana, sex work, retail theft. And I think we can move quickly into a bail policy recommending that there be no cash bail and tell them it's coming. And we have uh, eight episodes, which are almost one hour long. So it's, um, as you say, 360 degrees view of that. When did you know that you wanted to make the series? And what was that? What was the first idea? I had, I had heard Larry's name for many years. He had represented a bunch of friends of mine who were activists, um, but I never actually met him. And uh, a mutual friend had mentioned that he was running to be district attorney. And it seemed just a hilarious, absurd idea, but an interesting thing to document. And um, so the idea was to, to document this campaign. And when we realized he was actually gonna win, which we did not expect at all, um, we realized quickly, you know, well, the real story is, are you actually going to be able to do any of these things that you set out to do? Should you be doing these things that you set out to do? What's going to happen next? We decided to follow the story and uh, embed ourselves inside the district attorney's office and to, uh, to also embed ourselves within these other stakeholders around the city and these other, um, uh, these other institutions in order to follow the story forward. You know, I think as a voter, as a citizen, as a resident of a, of a city, you know, we, we never feel like change is happening fast enough. And then we elect people and then we're like, you know, what happened? Why, why aren't all these changes actually happening? And I think, you know, even when you want to trust a politician, you just don't quite understand, you know, what is, what is the friction once you go inside the system? And the, and the fact that Ted and Yoni were able to get this access to actually observe and see, okay, here you have, you know, a politician who we believe is acting in good faith to really try and push things as fast as possible. So what are going to be the things internally that actually push back? What does that look like? And how can that sort of, you know, inform all of us in terms of our, our civic engagement to sort of think about what we need to do as, you know, as residents, if we want change to sort of understand better, what are the things that, where are the places where we can engage to actually help propel that change? Just to add one, one thought is that a lot of movies that have been made about crime and the justice system focus on the big trial, and the mysterious murder, true crime. And those kinds of stories are actually the aberration. They're not what most cases are in the criminal justice system. Most cases that cause mass incarceration are not sexy, mysterious crimes. They're, they're tragedies that happen on a low level where people are arrested for sex work, drug, drug possession, um, violence that is 
everyday violence in a way. And the way these cases are handled is through policy decisions. They're not handled through a big court case. 95% of all cases in the United States are resolved with a plea deal, which means the prosecutor brings it to the person and says, I have the evidence. The police saw you do it. There's no need for a trial. Just admit it and take your punishment. So these deals are essentially made through policy, which is why our film doesn't actually focus in the courtroom. We're not allowed to film in the courtroom in Philadelphia. And yet we made an eight hour series by focusing on what very few other films have ever been able to see, which is what happens in the black box of the prosecutor's office. And I think if you want to try to understand how the United States became the most incarcerated country in the world, you have to look at the decisions that happen in a prosecutor's office. And that's what we were able to do in our series. We're starting with a small list of mainly nonviolent, low-level offenses. So our top charge is possession with intent to deliver. Yeah, marijuana right here. Then DUI, retail theft, simple assault. This list of 33 charges accounts for 51% of all arrests. Within the office, we can make sure we engage the old guard folks and have them be a part of the team. We take all those people who are less than 10,000 bail and turn them into, into releases where it's appropriate. Um, that's a dramatic shift. Pennsylvania is not going to pass a law requiring that cash not be part of bail. That's never happening. But what we can do at the local level is that the district attorney can make recommendations because DAs have a lot of discretion. We'll have to nitpick because some things that are low bail, the public despises. One example, identity theft. And that's going to be what everybody's talking yeah. about. Everybody always talks in these terms of like what the public thinks or doesn't think. I'll tell you what the public's going to think. If they see a lot less people in jail for dumb stuff, they're going to think that's good. When did it actually start? Like how many, how many years back are we talking now? It was in 2017 that he ran. He was inaugurated January 2nd, 2018. Um, and we should say, you know, he's not the only progressive prosecutor in the United States. I don't know if there's sort of a parallel in Europe, but we've seen over the last five, 10 years in the United States, more and more people running on reform platforms to be the district attorney. And we should say that, you know, for the last 30 years, the, the real standard bearer of this role has been, you know, what we think of in the U.S. as just law and order prosecutors. So these are the ones that sort of, you know, the, the trope is sort of, you know, uh, lock them up and throw away the key is sort of the idea. It's like, how do we be tougher and tougher on crime? How do we lock up more and more people? That's sort of been the, the mindset that the criminal justice system here has had. Um, and most of the folks who have run for these positions, there are more than 2,500 elected DAs across the country. Every county has its own DA. Um, for the most part, they've been running unopposed. These are roles that most people, even though they touch you know, every aspect of our lives, really for the most part have been kind of out of the mainstream um, point of view. We sort of think of prosecutors as people who we see on TV and law and order, but we don't really understand you know, the breadth of their power or their policy decision-making as Yoni was saying. So there's really been sort of the beginning of this shift um, over the last few years to elect more of these prosecutors. And so you're seeing now, you know, Larry was sort of, he was not the first, you had Kim Fox in Chicago, who's, you know, runs an even bigger jurisdiction than Larry. You have Aramis Ayala in Florida, many women of color actually who are running in these roles. Um, and Larry was sort of maybe one of the most brash and he had the most, you know, history sort of fighting the police directly. And, you know, as the top law enforcement official, that is sort of a more provocative um, background to come into this role with. But now after he's been elected, we've seen other, you know, Rachel Rollins in Boston, we've seen a whole slate of these candidates. So it's really something that's gaining more and more traction in the US right now. And just to add one thing about the time frame is that Krasner's election in Philadelphia was really the first election that we had after Donald Trump was elected president. And so there was definitely a big feeling in Philadelphia, and I think around the United States of how do we make change on a local level? We maybe Congress is dysfunctional. Maybe we have a president whose policies we don't agree with, but what are the ways that we can affect change? And certainly in Philadelphia, people were really mobilized and excited that you could really try and revolutionize the justice system on a local level. Because even though we think about the United States as the most incarcerated country, 
most of those incarcerations are not happening by the federal government. They're happening by local prosecutors and they're going to state prison and city prisons. So more than the presidential election, if you care about mass incarceration, you need to care about who your local prosecutor is. You know, Larry is someone who believes wholeheartedly that this progressive prosecutor movement is the next step of the civil rights movement. And, um, you know, he really sees himself as like part of this broader movement of progressives all around the country, those who came before, those who are coming after. And the reason that he was interested in participating in the project was that he felt like you know, um, if people could, if people could see behind the walls, if they could see a demystified version of what the district attorney is, what they do, see somebody like him who's an outsider who, by all accounts, has no business being the district attorney. If they could see him in that role, then it would be easier for them, in his mind, to imagine themselves in that role and to imagine themselves running for office. And perhaps if they could see some of the mistakes that he made, they wouldn't make them. Or if they could see some of the victories he had, then they could feel like it was possible too. And so he really felt like having a report card on his time in office, for better or worse, um, would be something that ultimately could serve this movement that is growing around the country. I felt that you were absolutely not falling into a trap of following a certain agenda or campaigning for you know a certain idea. Um, and um, I felt that you were always, as you are saying, trying to show more nuance and more different uh, voices and everything. And how did you manage to bring your own personal convictions out of this equation as, as much as possible? Or was that even your what you wanted to do? You know, one of the biggest challenges we had was actually finding people inside the DA's office who were willing to um, talk to us about how uncomfortable they felt, about how much they disagreed with what was what, what was going on, how much they didn't like what was going on, because, I mean, it's crazy. You know, they could get fired. Of course, you know, why would they stick their neck out and risk doing that? And, um, you know, so it was very difficult to find somebody who would want to do it. We had plenty of people kind of whisper to us, like, off camera, like, you know, I think this is terrible. You should know about this. Would you say it publicly? Absolutely not. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we have to give a lot of credit to uh, to Lisa Harvey, who's one of our characters, who decided that, you know, she was going to be honest, she was going to put it forward. You know, she really believes, um, you know, that she really believes in the mission of the DA's office and she wants to see it succeed. Yeah. And she was willing to call out stuff that she did not agree with. And we have to give her a lot of credit for that. The documentary that we made is the tip of the iceberg. So the relationships with Lisa Harvey, with the police captains, were all made not on camera, you know, we, we got to know them by going to the going away parties for their fellow employees who were fired by Larry Krasner. We would go there without our cameras so they could get to know us and understand that we weren't making a propaganda piece for Larry Krasner, that we genuinely wanted to hear what they had to say. And I think it's important to realize that in order to kind of get the little slivers of honesty from them on camera requires hours and hours and hours of trust building beforehand. And it's not to trick people. It's to genuinely convey to them your intention of why you're making this project. If the goal of the series is really to help people kind of understand how systems change, if you want them to change, how institutions develop, um, you know, you can't, you can't do that by just coming out with an indictment from the top. You really have to let people have their voice and really sort of understand, not, not necessarily always thinking about making an indictment about what has come behind us, but really just sort of see what are the conflicts in this moment that help us understand these larger structures. Um, and so to do that, I think really just sort of spending time with people and giving them their opportunity to sort of express the complexity of, of the life that they're living in that moment is really what kind of helps us understand where these tensions are. And I think, you know, coming into it, something that I kind of took for granted was just how, how deeply personal all of this is to every person within that institution. Um, but really, it's so much about the humans that are within these institutions and the cultural values that they bring forth that are going to determine how these systems are operating and how we're treating each other through these through these systems. What would you say, what can we, the world, the rest of the world, <laughs> learn from Philly DA? I think a lot of the stories that inspire people into activism usually are telling histories about the wins that activists had. And the part that they leave out of the story is the like 10, 20, maybe 30 years it took of 
defeats and small victories and step forward and a step backward in order to get to that place. And I think, you know, if you've ever been in like an activist group, you know, and, you know, you see, you know, you know how hard it is, how kind of unsexy it is, how difficult it is. And, and, you know, sometimes I think some of the storytelling that we tell to inspire people to make change and to get into activism also gives them a false expectation of what to expect when they do the work. And so you get so many people getting disillusioned, they burn out, they feel like they're failing, there's something wrong with them. And hopefully this story can kind of show people that no, it's normal. You know, it's supposed to be hard. It's not going to be fast. It never has been. Um, and anything that looked like it was fast was because it was built on years and years and years and years of work of the people that came before. And so keep going. Uh, you're doing the right thing. And, uh, you know, don't don't give up. Just keep going. This is this is how it's supposed to be. Thank you so much uh, for sharing these thoughts with me. And thank you uh, so much for uh, Philly DA, which uh, I hope we can share with uh, many, many people. And uh, all the best to you. Yeah, and thank you to the Berlin Ally for, for inviting us and for showing a documentary series. I think it speaks a lot to, you know, the expansive view of nonfiction filmmaking that you guys have. And so thank you. Yeah, we're so completely excited to be showing with you guys. So thank you again so much. It really, really means a lot. Yeah, and we hope we can be with you in the summer in person to actually uh, yeah. have the full and then, experience. And of course, all the Germans should come visit us in, in, in Philadelphia. I think there's a nonstop flight. So we all welcome you guys in Philadelphia. <laughs> yes, exactly. Let's do that. Yeah.